remember Roger White singing that song over 30 years ago. <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me tonight to the book of Hebrews chapter 7, and verse number 25. Hebrews chapter number 7 and verse 25. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Thank you, Father, for this holy word. I pray you'd bless it now as it goes forth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You can be seated. I'm going to talk about tonight about the fact that he's able, what he's able to do. He is able. Very able. Amen. Just remember one thing tonight. He's not a man trying to save a man with limited ability. He's the God-man who's capable of doing all above and beyond that all you could ask or think. I don't know how many people have said to him, that preacher, I can't live it, so I never will be saved. I just can't live it. And then I hear people talking about, well, they don't live it. And I'm not so sure I understand what you mean by living it, but I know this. I know that when God saves you, he gives you provision. And he is the supply of that provision for everything salvation encompasses. Salvation means deliverance. Salvation means security. Salvation means a change of identity. Identity, in plainer words, you're a son of God, child of God. Salvation is therefore multifaceted. Includes everything that God intends to do for the individual when he saves them. A lot of folks erroneously believe that, well, God reluctantly saved you, but he's waiting for you to slip up, and then he's going to put it to you, and you're finished. And you get that kind of idea, attitude from some people, and you even hear that kind of preaching, but that's not the case. He that begun a good work in you will perform it. Amen. He's able to save to the uttermost. That word uttermost means to the absolute fulfillment of what he started when he saved you in this world to take you into God's presence. Notice what's included here. He ever liveth to make intercession. Amen. That's in the very statement of the uttermost salvation. Your salvation is a completed event the moment you're born again. You're born again one time. You can only be born again one time. But that salvation is a working process in your daily life. And from victory to victory, from faith to faith, that God's move, as God moves you closer to himself. So therefore, the salvation of the Lord is not my ability to work it out. It's not anything I can produce. It's what God has already done for me. The Lord Jesus Christ is my salvation. He's made unto me righteousness and holiness and all the things that I need, and I need them so greatly, but they are all a person, and that person is able to meet every single need I have. The more you love the Lord Jesus, the more he becomes real in your soul. That's a clear mark that you're growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord. It's not how you fill your head full of facts. You ought to listen to the message that Tony Wilson preached this past Sunday night. I posted it on the front page of the Lion of Judah. It's an outstanding message. And the point, one of the, one of the best points he made in that message is that there's so many people, especially if you're smart, and we've got a lot of smart people that get saved, they fill their head full of knowledge. They're able to argue with anyone, but that is not a sign of growth in grace. Not a sign at all. As a matter of fact, sometimes it can work against you because you get puffed up. Knowledge puffeth up, and you get puffed up and aren't uh, and didn't and, and were never and, and never weaned from the milk of the word. From the beginning, the first principles were the oracles of God, the things that is necessary, the foundational things, the things that absolutely are needful in order for you to build a Christian life. You've got to establish these. You've got to firmly place them right in your life. And a lot of folks try to, they think they can bypass that. That's arrogance and pride on the part of any individual who believes that they can bypass the milk of the Word. When you're born again, that's what you need. Desire the sincere milk of the Word where you may grow thereby. And you've got to have that. Amen. You don't, you don't take a baby and start feeding a T-bone steak. You give that child milk. <laughs> Amen. They'll eat plenty later, and <laughs> believe me. <laughs> But when, you, when they're first born again, and when they're first born, they need milk, the milk of the Word. So obviously that tells you that the Word of God 
the Word of God, spans the spectrum from milk to meat. And if all you ever eat from the Bible is meat, you're going to get choked on it. You need the milk. You need to go back to the first principles of the oracles of God, to the very, to the very simple things of Scripture, and for the Holy Spirit to make them real in your heart. So he's able to save to the uttermost. God's had a job to do since he saved me in 73. I don't know about you, but he's had a hard, hard road of it with me. I, I, I've given him a fit. And uh, there have been times, no doubt, if he'd been like an earthly father, he'd thrown his hands up and said, what in the world am I doing with this one? Why did I ever start with him? But no, that's not God. That's not God. He knew when he saved me what I was made of. He knew where I came from. And he knew what he intended to do with me. And that is the key. He's able to save to the uttermost. Complete, perfect, pure, authored in heaven salvation. Not made by man, orchestrated by a church, but it's made by the Lord God himself. Amen. I've failed him, preacher. I've come short, preacher. I know you have, and so have I. We all have and all will. But that salvation is perfect. The Bible says he is the author of eternal salvation to everyone that believeth in him. That word author simply means the Lord Jesus Christ laid it out exactly what it took to save your soul and life and to present you blameless in His presence. So when He saved you, He began a process in you that will never be finished until He takes you from this earth and presents you in His presence. I'm glad, thank God, He's able to keep that which I commit to Him. I'm glad He didn't tell me to keep it. He's able to keep that which I've committed. The Apostle Paul did. That's what he said and that's what I believe. He's able to keep and folks, the most precious soul you have, what should it profit you if you gain the whole world and lose what? Your soul. That's the most precious thing you have is your soul. And I see people get all excited about getting rich in this world. And there's not a nickel of it you can take with you. Not a dime. I want you to notice in the book of Romans chapter 14, verse number 4. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Now, you don't walk in my shoes and I don't walk in your shoes. I'm not accountable for you and you're not accountable for me. We've all got different past. We've all got different life. We're all different. And I'm glad, aren't you? We're not, we're not carbon copies, rubber stamped. I am. That's what uh, variety is about. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, it tells you plainly. One's a foot, one's a hand. And during the make up the different parts of the body of Christ, we all have our part, we all have our piece. And every one of us is dependent upon the other. And none can say I'm better than you because I'm not you and what have you. That's what he's talking about. <coughs> he's able to give me grace that I need to stand and hold me up. And he may not give you the same grace because you're not weak where I'm weak. You don't fail where I fail. You're not made like I'm made. You don't have my past. You've got your past. There are areas that have affected me for the rest of my life, as our brother talked about again Sunday night. He had things done to him as a child. He'll carry that as long as he lives. A lot of people that have never had anything like that happen can't understand what that's like. But if you've ever been through it, you understand what it's like. God makes provision for that. That's what he's talking about. He's able to make him stand. He ministers to the individual, the heart. All he wants out of you is a willing heart. A willing heart. That's all. Don't try. And, people, and I know people mean well. I know they do. And I don't want to be hypercritical. But I know I've seen so many times people stand somebody up and say, now this is the kind of Christian you need to be. No, you need to be what God made you to be when he saved your soul. Amen. Thank God for what they are. I'm not against that. <laughs> Praise God. But I can't be them. And you're not required to be me. Aren't you glad? <laughs> Amen. We are individuals in the body of Christ. The thing I love about, one of the things that I love about the Lord, which are many, but one of the things is the variety. My goodness gracious. If you just look at the animal creation, 
Look at the variety of what God put out there. And then look up into the heavens and feast your eyes upon this creation. And all of this came from the mind of the Creator. And of all the billions of people that have lived upon this earth, I do not believe any two are exactly the same. No. So whoever told you that you have to be exactly like such and such a Christian, they told you wrong. They might have been a good person, meant well, but they told you wrong. You be you. And you be the one God made you to be because you've got a reason for being here. There's a place you feel nobody else can fill. There's a ministry for you nobody else can minister. You have a place in the body of Christ. Aren't you glad that every bit, every stone, every part of that, body, of that wall, of that body, of that temple is fitly framed together? Yeah. It's built into a holy temple of the Lord, a dwelling place of the Spirit of God. Well, you say, preacher, where am I supposed to? You don't put anything. It's not up to men to put you in that wall. God does. And when he builds the temple of God, the body of Christ, which is, a, which is a type of the body of Christ, he put you in that wall. And it's not up to a man to accept or reject you. God didn't put that power in our hands. Aren't you glad? The third thing is in Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse 18. In Hebrews 2, 18. For in that he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. This has to do with the ministry of Christ as he ministers at the Father's right hand, built upon suffering. The things that he learned as he suffered. Now what does the Bible say about suffering as it relates to a Christian or a human? He that hath suffered hath ceased from sin. Suffering has a way of realigning our perspective. It causes us to think and see differently. Suffering brings our, uh, brings our uh, uh, priorities, if you, if you please, together in the right way. Suffering draws us closer to God in a way that nothing else can draw us. Suffering has a way of making a clear distinction between the eternal and the temporal. And some folks have suffered to the point that they don't want to suffer like that the rest of your life. On this earth, I was told about our sister, McDonald. She'd been in the hospital now for two or three days, suffering. She calls me and I pray with her. She's suffering. While we can't fantasize, we're not supposed to. We can't take her place. We can't say, I know how you feel. That's not going to help her. We pray for her. Randy Pike falls. A missionary spends decades on the foreign field. Here not too long ago, he fell again. He falls. Hasn't he suffered enough? There's a book in the library back here that talks about the suffering, the ministry, the suffering of the saints. He that has suffered. There's something about suffering that God does by his wisdom and his providence choose for certain people. You wouldn't choose it for yourself. You'd be a fool. That's not our choice. But the hand of God chooses undoubtedly for some people to suffer. But the Bible said he's able to succor them. That word succor means help. It means to help them. Help. Now, help means that you are in the battle. You're in the fight. You're where you're supposed to be. But there comes a time when you need just a little extra hand a helping hand. He doesn't take your place. He doesn't do it for you. But he helps you. Now that makes a big difference. That makes a big difference. To know that he helps you. He's able to succor. Notice now all these things. All these nuances of life. People talk about life where he's on the mountain or he's in the valley. Well that's very true. Well, sometimes there's a long way between the valley to the mountain. On a lot of different stages, up and down, that doesn't necessarily fit. So it's, no, it's, not, it's not so easy. Everything, we have a tendency to make everything black and white, to make it, to simplify it. Well, a lot of things aren't simple. Life is not simple. Not at all. But he's a helper. He can help you. Put your heart into it. 
Put your heart into it, and you'll find his hand right there. You'll find his hand. I love the way Spurgeon said it 150 years ago. He said, if he ever gives you a load to bear, he'll always carry the heaviest part. <laughs> you'll always carry the heaviest part. You'll always carry the heaviest part. He calls us. I don't do that. No pastor does that. I don't have that right. I'm just like you. But he does give us ministries to help. He helps us. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 9 and verse number 8. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. We read these words. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. All grace. It was the grace of God that reached out and spoke to me in 1973. It was the grace of God that drew me to the cross. The grace of God is God's vehicle where he communicates with you. It's his way of touching you. It's his way of reaching you. The grace of God. He has to. Can a holy Lord God reach down and touch one of his creatures that are sinful? Well, folks, we couldn't stand that. But through grace, he touches us. In plainer words, through the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. That's the ministry of God touching mankind. When the potter puts his hand to the clay, he never touches hand to clay. He puts his hands in the water, then brings it up to the clay. So the water becomes the vehicle between the hand and the clay. The water is a picture of the Holy Spirit. God, by His Spirit, nudges and moves and soothes and comforts and, in, and directs our hearts. He ministers grace, grace that abides and abounds, grace when you need it, the kind of grace that you need when you go through hard times and good times. Most of the time, if you don't realize it tonight, you're not the most vulnerable in bad times. You're the most, most vulnerable in good times. It's then that a man has a tendency to say, well, I have prospered and let's build bigger barns. Uh, soul, take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. And then God says, thou fool, this night thy soul should be required of thee. Grace is what we need by the power of the Holy Spirit. And folks, if we only realize tonight how important the Holy Spirit is in everything God does for us and to us, if we only understood that, this is why he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Clinch not the Holy Spirit of God. Pray for the filling of the Holy Spirit of God. Ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. Walk in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Anything otherwise is the work of the flesh. It may be well intended. You may have a good motive behind it. You may want to do something for the glory of God. But when you try to do it in the arm of the flesh, in plain words, in human ability, without relying upon the strength that comes only from the Holy Spirit, that's arrogance and pride. And you can't get it done. You won't get it done. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit. Christ would not enter on his earthly ministry until he had been anointed. First, he was baptized. Then he spent 40 days in the wilderness. And then when he came out of that wilderness, he was ready to go out and walk in the fullness of the Spirit of God. God gave him unction at Jordan. The Holy Ghost came down like a dove. Then for 40 days of testing for the death of the flesh in every sense of the word and the full understanding of his enemy, he came face to face with him. Then he walked out of that wilderness. The Son of Man, full of the Holy Ghost, by the power of the Spirit of God that God did not give to him by measure. Hallelujah to God. God gave him the Holy Ghost in its fullness. And every word and every deed and every step and everything and every one, every breath that he drew, every thought that he had, everything for the rest of his life was completely and absolutely saturated with the Holy Spirit of God. He received grace to minister and that's what we have to have. So we have to humble ourselves and we have to be obedient. We have to be able to receive the Holy Spirit and work. 
you know, a Baptist, Baptist, and I'm a Baptist and probably will be the day God takes me from this earth, but I don't, I don't go around talking and thinking about being a Baptist. I'm a Christian. But for so long, the Holy Spirit has been theology 101, pneumatology. That's the Greek word for spirit, pneuma, pneumatos. So, you know, they categorize it and they, and they box it up and they, and they present it in a fashion. Well, the Holy Ghost, uh, you receive the Holy Ghost when you get saved and, and you're baptized by the sp uh, Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And then, therefore, you've got that until the day you die. So what in the world do you need to ask for the Holy Spirit for? It's almost like, you know, God gave you everything when you got saved. God gave you everything to get saved and get started with. But there's so much more. So much more. So much more. Be not drunk with wine, the apostle cries out. But be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. You can't preach without the Holy Ghost. You can't witness without the Holy Ghost. You can't live for Christ without the Holy Spirit. You can't read the Word of God and get anything out of it without the Holy Ghost. You can't commune with each other without the Holy Spirit. You can't have a prayer life without the Holy Ghost. You can't do anything without the Holy Spirit. Christ said without me you can do nothing, but you can't have Him. You can never have Christ without the Holy Spirit. It just won't work. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes the Godhead real to us. And He's the one you can't see. And He cannot be, uh, you know, He's as they you know, commonly refer to as the third person of the Trinity, or the Holy Trinity. But the bottom line is he is the of the Father, by the Son, through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. That's the Bible uh, order. It originates from the mind of the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the way everything is done. And of him and by him and through him are all things. Don't ever overlook the Holy Spirit. Don't ever take it for granted that you've got the fullness of the Spirit. The fullness of the Spirit of God is a blessing and a gift to us. And we should desire that by all means, the Holy Spirit of God. So the Bible says in Jude chapter number 20, Jude verse 24, only one chapter. Jude verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. That's for a man or a woman that's reached their limit. He's still able to keep you from falling. That's for you when sin overtakes you. And the sins of the flesh and the besetting sins begin to eat at your soul. He's still able to keep you from falling. You say, oh, now, preacher, when you sin, you've fallen. No, 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 no. You've jumped the gun. You've fallen when you've moved away from the only one that is able to keep you from falling. The Lord Jesus Christ. You make a conscious move away from him. And say, what's the use? It's vain. It's empty. This Christian faith is not what I thought it was. And I'm going back to where I came from. Well, you can do that. God lets you do that. Your volition is one of the great gifts God gives you. Your choice, your ability to choose. He won't force you. But that's not, but, but uh, that's when you walk away from him and you consciously choose to walk away from him, that's when you're falling. For example, it's used in the book of Galatians where it talks about falling, they have fallen from grace. But if you'll read the context of that very carefully, it has nothing to do with any particular sin that you've committed. It has to do with a state of mind. So easy to throw these things out to people, say, well, he's backslid, he's fallen from grace. Go read the text carefully. It's talking about an attitude to change mind. Hebrews in two places, as I quoted it to you the other night, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucified themselves, the Son of God afresh, put him to an open shame. Those who trample under their feet the blood of the Son of God, if they, if, they, if they turn away, make a conscious decision, leave Christ. How many of you know you love him and you struggle in your Christian walk and you know you're not perfect, yet you still keep trying or you keep praying and you keep living for him, you keep loving him and you want to come back to him? That, my friend, is not falling. There's a difference. You say, you mean the Bible can get that specific? In the, the Bible can get every toe on your foot and every step that toe takes. And how long your toenails are. <laughs> 
The Word of God knows you from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet and count every hair on the top of your head. Amen. And doesn't take long, doesn't take God near as long to count mine as it used to. <laughs> My wife is a magician. She's an artist. You wouldn't believe it. She can do more with 50 hairs than anybody on the face of the earth. <laughs> if you're vain, <laughs> if, if you spend your days in front of a mirror, I feel for you. <laughs> As time takes its toll, <laughs> life will get harder for you. Thanks be unto God if it, gives you, if it can give you the right attitude to understand that the outward man and the inward man is renewed day by day. <laughs> I've got photographs of me when I was playing basketball rural high school, 16, 17 years old. My head was just as black and thick as it could be. Yeah, I weighed 168 pounds when I graduated from high school, six foot three. I could jump up and grab a hold of the rim of a basketball goal, all this stuff. But folks, I can't get a quarter of an inch off the floor now. <laughs> hey, man. And my face looks like a mountain, got ridges and my tops and hills and mountains. And Good night. You think I go around pining all day long about that? Whining and carrying on about it? about what I look like, 68 years old. I think to myself, what am I going to look like at 78? <laughs> or 88, or 98, or 108? <laughs> what if God lets me live to be as old as Abraham, 175? Surely the Lord will come back before then. <laughs> There's one thing that is inexorable. You can't stop it. It's going to happen. Aging. The outward man perishes, but the inward man, that's the me talking to you right now. He's renewed day by day. Amen. In the book of Philippians chapter number 3, I've got two more and I'll close with these. Philippians chapter number 2 and verse number 30, uh, 20, uh, chapter, Philippians 3, 21. I'll get it right here in a minute. Philippians chapter number 3 and verse number 21. Who shall change our vile body? Now, when that word vile shows up here in verse 21, just put in the back of your mind, weak, contemptible. That's what he's talking about. You wouldn't for a moment try to take this body you're in, would you, and approach God. You wouldn't last long. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned, what? Like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue, able to subdue all things unto himself. Now, the Lord God's omnipotent, folks. He's omnipotent. That, that's a big word, but it, it means he has all power. Omnipotent. He has all power. God has all power. He can do anything, but he can't lie. It's impossible for God to lie. Because of his very nature, there are things that he cannot do because he's holy, holy, holy. But if you'll notice, the Bible said that he will, according to this glorious body, he's going to change my vile body like his glorious body. Now, the Bible says we know if the earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. What's that mean? That means from earth you come to earth you go. From the dust of the ground to the dust of the ground. But there's more to you than the body. The body's a tabernacle that you live in. When he saved you, you were born again. Then he saves your soul over a process through a lifetime. Please don't misunderstand when I say that. He's not saving and resaving and resaving and resaving. You just read here where he's able to make intercession for you. That is the daily life you live. But your body, what's he going to do with that? The spirit's taken care of, born again. The soul is saved, but what about the body? I mean, after all, he's not going to let you float around up here on a cloud somewhere with a harp, right? <clears throat> Pardon? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Amen. A body. What kind of body? Pardon? A glorified body. What kind of body did the Lord have when he rose from the dead? Was his body glorified before he rose from the dead? If it had been, he couldn't have died. God had to become man 
in order for him to die. It's impossible for God to die. That's another impossibility. Utterly impossible for God to die. So God had to become a man, the God-man, so that he could die. On the third day, God raised him from the dead. And I got thinking about that the other day, and it just kind of struck me. I'm a one who believes in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. But I'll tell you in a heartbeat that that's a mystery that you cannot break down in your mind. But I'll tell you something to think about. There are those who think that God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Ghost are all one. They're called modalist. They believe that simply the Father was Jesus Christ acting in creation. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Son, so therefore the Son, the Lord Jesus, is everything. There is nothing apart from Him. If that be true, what happened for those three days when He was dead and descended down into the heart of the earth? It's something to think about, isn't it? Was God the Father still God the Father on the throne? Absolutely. Was the Holy Spirit still the Holy Spirit on this earth? Absolutely. Amen. Was the Son, therefore, where he had descended because of who he was, carrying our sin, the sin bearer? Yes. There you see a clear and distinct change or difference in the appearance of the Godhead. Once again, the Godhead is a mystery. We'll see him as he is. The day will come when we see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And then we'll say, my, I never thought for a minute that that's the way it is. But that day will come. I can live with what I know now. If I have to be able to dissect him in order to serve him, then my mind is my God and not God. Always that element of mystery that surrounds him is the kind of thing that adds to the fact that he's who he is and we're who we are. And I know I came from him. And I know I'm going to him. And that's good enough for me while I walk in this clay, this tabernacle of clay, dirt on dirt. And the day will come that when I will be like him, for I shall see him as he is. He's able to do that, to subdue all things unto himself. His glorified body, when it rose from the dead, folks, was incapable of ever dying again. That's what I mean by that. And we will have a body like unto his glorious body. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, the apostle Paul spells it out over and over and over. This mortal shall put on immortality. This corruptible shall put on incorruption. This dishonorable shall put on honorable. Then shall be brought to pass the saying, O grave, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? It's been swallowed up in victory, swallowed up in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did at the cross. Hallelujah to God. Amen. Amen. And then the last one is this. If you look at Ephesians chapter number 3 and verse number 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Aren't you glad that God doesn't limit his relationship with you and what he's able to do for you to what you're able to think in your fallen mind? Don't ever let anybody tell you, if you can think it, God will do it. Folks, God can do far beyond what you can ever think. In other words, did God put himself in a cage and say, well, as long as you can think it, I can do it? What happens when your thinker begins to get uh, <laughs> with age, you know? I've got a good memory, about five seconds long. <laughs> <clears throat> you see what I mean? I can remember stuff that happened to me when I was 17 years old better than I can remember what happened yesterday. When I took a little class in Bible school, they taught us that you have short-term and long-term memory. They said they're distinct, short-term, long-term. This is why... Uh, you reach a certain point in age where you can remember things that happened a long time ago, but you can't remember the, the immediate. Well, the immediate, of course, is the short-term memory. The other is the long-term memory. Now, do you think God has brought me to the point to where if I, my, my muddled mind, my decaying gray matter, that he can only do for me what I can think up here in my head? Or is God above that? He can do above and beyond all that we could ask or think. Hallelujah. God knows what's good for us. I like that. He's able to do above. Notice in Ephesians 20, 21. In whom all, the, in the three twenty one, 
Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Above, beyond all that we could ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. One of the great secrets of the Christian life and mysteries of our salvation is to learn the power that's in us. By force of will and by intellect and by human achievement and ability, you'll never touch that power. But in a humble state of mind, a broken and contrite spirit, a hungry soul, you can tap in to unbelievable power. Sometimes I wonder when you go to the bedside and pray for someone that everybody else has prayed for and they seem to be getting no better and then you lay your hand on them and all of a sudden something happens. You've tapped into that power. Now it's not like tapping into an oil well where you've got this indifferent, uh, just a, cre a, cre a created thing, creation. We're talking about reaching the very Spirit of God Himself. Isn't that an amazing thing? That God gave us that, it's ours, it's our heritage, it's what brings us together. The Spirit of God. When we pray for each other, we're not giving out empty words or, you know, pious platitudes. Well, we're going to pray for you. But in the back of your mind, you've, you're saying, well, the doctors have already said there's no hope. That's not that attitude. The attitude is, it doesn't make any difference what the doctor said. Thank God for the good doctors. But it's up to the great physician. And he may wait till the last moment. And sometimes he does wait till the last moment to prove that it was his hand that did it. That all hope was exhausted. All human ability had reached its end. Then God intervenes and raises them up. That's why I tell you never quit. That's why I tell you when you pray for somebody, don't ever give up. I walked into the room of a woman over there in Maryville, Blunt Memorial Hospital. And she was dying with cancer. She was in such a depressed state, it was unbelievable. The doctors had told her, you're going to die. You've only got so much time left. The ministers that had ministered to her had put on this facade of, oh, we love you. We're going to pray for you, you know. God can heal you. God can raise you up. But she sensed in her spirit that they were nothing more than a mouthpiece for the professionals who said, you're going to die. I took her by the hand and I said, it's up to God whether you live or die. It's up to Him. He's the one who makes that decision. And He gave her hope. It gave her hope. It moved something in her soul and in her spirit. I appreciate the doctors and I respect them and I love them. Make no mistake, I do and you know that. But folks, the doctor is not the last word. That, is, that comes from the sovereignty of God. And sometimes he'll test your faith and try you. He'll try you to the, he'll try you to the breaking point. He'll try you to the point where you think there is no hope. But there's always hope if you know the Lord God. There's always hope. Always. I have watched God raise people up off the deathbed. I've watched him do it. I've seen it happen. I know what I'm talking about. And people making funeral arrangements and they say they're gone. Go ahead and make your arrangement. They'll be dead in 24 hours, 48 hours. It's over. It's finished. And watch God raise them right up from there now in full health and preaching the Word of God. God can do it. Don't ever look to man as the final word. Look to God. He's able to do above and beyond all that you ask or think. If you've got a loved one that's not living for God, you've got a family member that's out of the will of God, you've got someone that you love dearly and you know they're not right with God, what you want to do is take hold of them and shake them and say, look, listen to me, look where you're going. You know, I know that's the flesh. I know you feel like, I feel that same way. Sometimes I like to, to just take hold of them and jerk them up sometimes and say, listen to me. You realize what you're doing with your life? But that's not going to change them. It takes the power of God. It takes the power of God to change any of us. Now be serious and honest tonight. How did you get here? 
What got you right with God? How were you saved to begin with? God did it. If I took a survey in the average church in this country and just talked to the people, and I'm not God and I'm not their judge, but just talk to them, you'd be amazed at how many of them don't have a clue. I mean, they give their testimony, quote, unquote, but they've never been convicted. Having never been convicted, they've never been converted. And the pulpits are full of people like that. Conviction is one of the greatest blessings you'll ever get from God. Amen. You ought to shout. You don't feel like shouting. You no know, shouting going on. But that conviction is the work of the Holy Spirit of God in your soul. That's drawing you. And then the conversion follows. And then when conversion comes, you're going to shout. You're going to, you're going to cry. You're going to, you're going to do your thing, like I told you a few minutes ago. You are you. You are the individual God made you to be, and that's the way you're going to react. I've seen people born again, buddy, and didn't shed one tear, but their life was absolutely, completely, dramatically changed. I've seen people saved and run all over the building. They were saved, and, and their life completely and absolutely changed. No two people are the same. So don't ever listen to anybody give you their testimony and think, well, that's the standard. That's the way it is. I guess that's the way I'm going to have to be. And since I didn't do that, I must not have been saved. No. No, 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 no. I've heard too much of that junk, too. No, 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 no. I remember Oliver Green. When I first got saved, I listened to him all the, every day. I listened to Oliver B. Green from Greenville, South Carolina. And I listened to uh, uh, Harold Seitler. And I listened to Lester Roloff. I started listening to these old preachers, these men of God, and God used them to, to, and Oliver Green was a black sheep in his family. That's what he said. He was a black sheep. And then he was talking about how that uh, when they'd have a service and the Spirit of God move into that service and people, he said, would be shouting, they'd be weeping and, and rejoicing in the Lord. I remember Oliver Green saying that, and I hadn't been saved long. But here's what he said about himself. He said, I don't do that. He said, there's this calm, gentleness, and sweetness that moves in my soul. But I don't react the same way as the others. And that's not saying they're wrong. That's just the way he is. Is there anything wrong with that? No. No. We're not all the same. There's a man on the mission field right now. And he's in his 80s now. And he's been in this pulpit many times. And he's, he's, he's one of the men in this world that I have great respect for. I have his picture on the wall in my office, me standing next to him. Did you know that he had a prostitute house? He ran a whore house before he got saved? Some of you know who I'm talking about? Now, you religionist, pious and holy crowd. If you knew what kind of man this was, what he's done for the Lord, where he slept under bridges yeah. with the lepers, ate yeah. their food. And now I have more respect for him by the day. Great respect for that man of God. What happened to him, preacher? He got saved. <laughs> Father, in thy name we pray. Glorify thyself tonight. In Jesus' sweet name, I ask it. In thy holy name, for Jesus' sake, no glory, none to us, all to thee. In thy holy name.